Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Wendy Dillard here. Today is Thursday, January the 18th, 2018, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, your second daily dose of happy for the day. And uh, this morning, Wendy, Joel, and I did the first daily dose, and we, we agreed after the show it was probably one of the best ones that he and I had ever done together. So once again, the gauntlet has been thrown down. We have to try to match or beat it. What do you think? You just love to raise the standard. But, I you know, do. It's I'm fun. Always up to <laughs> I especially like it when it's a, a non-threatening kind of standard because that's that's the fun kind to go after. Let's, let's see how <laughs> how high we can raise our vibration level. That's always fun, right? Oh, because there's no resistance in it. <laughs> that's right. There's no resistance in it. Exactly. That's what makes it so much fun. Yes. So um, anyway, we we thought we would talk today about the fact that there are so many people now who are discovering the law of attraction and trying to apply it in their lives. And you can find groups on it. I mean, on Facebook, there are groups with like tens of thousands of people in the group. And uh, some of them are more active than others, of course, but the more active ones, I mean, I mean you, you, you look at uh, some posts and then you look like 10 minutes later, it's a, a whole new list of posts because so many different posts are coming through and so many people are responding to different things. So they're very, very active groups. But as a result of the fact that they are all, not all, that many of them are relatively new to the law of attraction, some of the advice that ends up out there is a little bit not quite ideal, shall we say. <laughs> so, oh, that was well said. <laughs> it, was, it was very, very softly said. But uh, yeah, some of the advice is, is a, little bit, a little bit wacky at times, perhaps. So we thought we'd... Uh, talk about some of the the not so great pieces of advice that people give and what would be better alternatives Um, but before we do that before we do that wendy do you have anything that's been really great happening in the last 24 hours it's always tough for you and me because we do the show every day whereas the other co-hosts they get a week to think about it sometimes you have to come up with it every day you know but anything good happening in the last Um, 24 hours yeah well um now what i'm going to say on the surface may sound like it's not a win okay but you know i feel like anytime you turn something around from negative to positive that is a win especially oh absolutely if you get new awareness oh, so yeah um last night i started to notice i was getting kind of like cold symptoms coming on oh. and you know they were not fun and you know it's like my ears started to hurt and my throat started getting a little scratchy and so i noticed that my immediate focus went to the symptoms and it was kind of fascinating as I think about it now how I mean I was so focused I mean like every three seconds I was swallowing or every two seconds I was testing you know the pressure and really paying attention and I thought oh my gosh how on earth am I doing that or why am I doing that but it just really got my attention that I was so wrapped up in it Mm. um although i will say i I, it didn't get my attention until well after the fact so what i'm saying is i was really focused on these symptoms in my head last night and um you know during the night i woke up and i was like oh my throat's a little bit sore than it was before and i noticed like one one nostril was all (laughs) stuffy and probably middle of the night you know as i'm rolling around just noticing my symptoms i went what the heck am i doing focused on this yeah why is this what i focus on i'm like the perpetual happy kind of gal who's using law of attraction left right and all over to manifest some magnificent (laughs) things and i'm focusing like this is it amazing oh my goodness well, you know, and Abraham oftentimes will say to, you know, the audience, you're sloppy thinkers. <laughs> yeah, they thought, do say that. <laughs> this is one of these moments where I'm like, oh, my God, I'm being a really sloppy thinker. I'm just kind of going by default. So once I had that awareness, I thought to myself, well, what do I want to think about? What will help move me from here? So I went to my standby, which is everything's always working out for me. And then I went, um, what else? (laughs) And it took me a few moments. I'm like, come on, Wendy, you know there's other positive (laughs) things you can think about. And so, you know, I started saying things like, well, I'm generally a very healthy person. Um, I mean, wellness is more about me than not. And, you know, I live in well-being and I'm thriving. and, And what I love to know, even if my body is having, you know, quote, cold symptoms, it's my body's way of doing what it wants to do in order to bring health to me. So I don't have to look at this as a bad thing. It's like if there's something in my body 
that requires a little bit of extra support, my body's going for it. And so, you know, I don't know, was that 15, 17 seconds worth? But it was enough to give me a sense of calm and feeling better. And then I kind of said to myself, okay, well, obviously I've been so focused on my symptoms. What if the next time I recognized I was focused on the symptoms, I just immediately did a turnaround and said everything's always working out for me, my body loves to be healthy, or something along that line. And that felt good. Mm. So as I was sleeping, you know, whenever I'd wake up and have to blow my nose or something like that, I would just tell myself, you know, hey, everything's always working out for me. My body's doing what it wants to do in order to bring me health. All is well. And so that in itself to me was a big win because I know in the past when I've had cold symptoms, I I can now go back and recognize how so obsessed I was with focusing on the symptoms. Mm, sure. You know, and oh, I yeah. feel like I kind of broke through that where – even if I were to have cold symptoms in the future, I don't think I'll be quite as obsessed because it really stuck out to me that it was so unusual for my life and my lifestyle to be so bizarrely negatively focused. So, well, anyway, yeah, that, you, de- you definitely that, deserve that was my win that I recognized that what I've been doing. Yeah, oh yeah, that's definitely a win. I I totally put that in the win column. And in fact, as you're Telling that story, I'm realizing we, we've actually had a few uh, people here, the co-hosts on the show. Cindy was uh, kind of laid up for a number of days there. She was really suffering. And uh, David got sick, too. And, you know, there, there's this is the time of year when you always get somebody saying that it's going around, right? Well, I kept... I hear it all the time, but I don't believe in it. So. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, I, I kept going out to, you know, go on my walks or, you know, go out on errands or whatever, and I'd, I'd get that little quick thought about it's going around or David got sick or Cindy got sick, and instantly, I didn't even have to do anything. This is So this, this is definitely a win. Instantly, my mind was saying, well, thank goodness I'm well. <laughs> instantly. I mean, I didn't even have to think about it. I just came, well, I'm, I'm in great shape. I'm, I'm feeling really healthy, even if it wasn't necessarily true. I mean, I did that one well, one day when when there was like a gale wind at about you know twenty degrees blowing in my face, which made it feel like minus twenty. And I was saying, well, at least I'm healthy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I had lunch with somebody on Saturday, and we had postponed the lunch because he hadn't been feeling good during the week. Um, and so when we started lunch, he said, you know, pardon me if I'm doing a little bit of sniffling, you know, because I because I really don't want you to get sick. And I remember thinking as well as saying out loud, I said, oh, I'm healthy, all is well. And so, and I really truly believe that because mm-hmm. there have been people sneezing in my face before and Yuck. I still don't get sick. I mean, I'm a very healthy person. I think, one, I have a healthy constitution, but two, I know my thoughts help to support the idea of me being healthy. Oh, yeah. So it was interesting, though, because last night, just for a moment, I went, oh, my God, maybe I got sick because he was sick. I said, Wendy, you don't even believe that. (laughs) I love that. It it was just so surprising to me that those (laughs) thoughts can just pop in. And I'm like, where did that come from? And I went, well, I have been hearing a lot of people lately, just like you, talking about the cold season and the flu season. And I know two people who have reported to me that they got flu shots and then they got the flu. And, you know, so it's kind of like without really even recognizing it, The conversation of that has been out there, and I've been subject to it, if you will. Mm -hmm. Exposed to it, anyway. Yeah, and and not that I went out of my way to go, oh, I can't think those thoughts. But at the same time, I'm aware that people have been talking about it a lot, and, and maybe I was a little bit more focused on it than I realized. But it was really funny when I'm like, oh, my God, I got the cold from him over the weekend. I'm like... You don't believe that. <laughs> I think that's the line of the day. Wendy, you don't believe that. That's the best sentence that I've heard all week. That's great. I love that one. <laughs> oh, does that mean that we just beat the, beat the morning show? <laughs> yeah, I think we beat the morning show already. Right. We just did it. Sorry, Joel. We just wiped it out with one line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Joel, we're throwing the baton back to you. <laughs> of course, I guess we have to do that for the entire show because that's the way the whole show went this morning. But okay, that's another thing. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what do you do when you know you don't believe something and yet you start to just examine it 
and it pops up automatically. It's like, that to me was so bizarre. It's like, you don't believe that, and you know you don't. <laughs> you, you, you treated that so beautifully, though. You just dismissed it. You weren't angry at yourself or anything. You just kind of it's mocked awesome. it a little bit to, to laugh at yourself, and, and that shook it off. That was good. You shake. You that shook. really was probably the best laugh I had yeah, <laughs> concerning was... all the cold symptoms because that really, really made me giggle because I know I don't believe that, oh, just because someone's sick, you're going to get sick. And by the way, for anyone who wonders if the story really worked out, they can hear in Wendy's voice, she's not exhibiting cold symptoms. So clearly it worked. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, here's a thought that just did pop into me. Um, You know, there is a, I'll call it an old, old wives tale. Okay. That if you're out in the cold and you don't have proper attire, that you'll get sick. Oh, right, yeah. You know, now, science has proven that, that is, you cannot get sick because of a temperature change. Um, now, that doesn't mean you can't get hypothermia under bizarre circumstances, but the average person walking outside when it's really cold, you know, or even if your, your neck is not covered by a scarf and, you know, it's, the wind is blowing, that is not a way that people get sick. And by the way, I I, I want to make it clear that Wendy is not endorsing what I see so many teenagers do, which is where they're walking out in their short sleeves and their shorts in 35-degree weather and walking around town. That's not what she's talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and so I have been noticing, or this I have noticed this in my own thoughts, that as I've gone out to get the mail, you know, um, or I've gone outside for other things, uh, sometimes I do it where, no, I'm not in shorts, but I do just throw on a really heavy wool coat, and I'm not really prepared for the weather other than I threw on a heavy wool coat. And I knew I wasn't going to be outside for about three minutes. And right. I thought to myself, oh, other people would think, Wendy, you're going to catch the death of cold because you're not properly dressed. And I've probably had that thought a minimum of a dozen times over the last week. Mm, wow. And so I don't believe, quote, I got cold symptoms because of how I was dressed when I went outside, but I will say I was entertaining those thoughts almost as a joke, Mm. but it was something I had focused on a lot. Yeah, okay. Well, that's that's probably how I drew it to myself. That could be. That that would certainly make sense because of what we know about Mm -hmm. how the LOA works. So, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So... Okay, well, actually, you know, the nuance that's involved in that kind of points to the topic today, really, when you think about it, because the topic is, you know, what do you do when you get conflicting advice, and particularly if you get it through social media, because that's where more people are getting it these days anyway, but just in general, if you get, you know, two different uh, pieces of advice about how to handle situation X, and you're not really sure which one to follow. Um, and I mean, you, you get lots of stuff in these groups. I mean, just to give you an idea, just, just some of the, uh, the initial posts that people put in. I mean, there, there's one that I saw today. It says, this is all it says in, in the post. If no one thinks you are weird, you are doing it wrong. <laughs> I'm thinking, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> well, that's kind of an, it also, when people post things in Facebook, you also find out what they believe. Yes. By those things, so she obviously thinks that when she practices law of attraction, other people will think her weird. Well, this is actually a male, but yes, that's true. Oh. And and it also in Facebook it tells you whether or not somebody's a new member, and this one is a new member. So obviously, this person just joined the group, <laughs> <laughs> and they're trying to make a splash. And uh, you know, well, they got some likes out of it, so you know, they got probably got the splash they were looking for. But uh, I agree with one of the <laughs> commenters saying, I still don't get it. <laughs> So you get stuff like that. Um, now here's another one. And, and interestingly enough, this person hasn't gotten any comments. Usually comments happen pretty quickly. And this person's comment was made, their, their post was made 15 minutes ago without any comments. Um, but she wrote, I have asked God a couple times now for a sign that my manifestation will happen eventually when the time is right. But I'm just not seeing anything. And then she put up a sm- uh, uh, upside down, a, a frown face, if you will. And I, I'm really surprised people aren't jumping on that. That's usually the one where you get 20 comments in a minute. <laughs> but that's not what happened in this case. So so, what, so let's play this little game here. What would you have expected that other people might have said to her in response to that? Oh, some of the, the, the typical things that 
you get our well first of all you usually get a number of people who just commiserate say you know that's that's exactly what's happened to me lately you know so it's the me too kind of comments you get a lot of those um you get some people who will suggest well focus on what it is that you want um some of them will perhaps take it a little step further they'll say focus on you on what you want and do it often and and try to keep yourself focused on it so other people will say well focus on it but don't focus on it too long because if you focus on it too long you won't get it so you can see they're trying to they're trying to put the advice out that that matches what their understanding is it's just not necessarily complete in those cases that makes sense yeah well and i i don't um i'm not involved in the facebook law of attraction groups but i am um, involved in a couple law of attraction groups on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And I would say to some level, some of the people are a little bit more sophisticated in their responses. Like, And the reason is because it is an Abraham Hicks law of attraction group. Right, okay. Um, but every now and then I find something that I'm like, well, that's pretty funky, <laughs> you know. And really the longer I've been involved with, you know, using law of attraction deliberately – the more I've, I've recognized, you know, exactly what we're talking about. There is some conflicting information, but I really think the conflict comes more from never really understanding the foundational premises. Like, I'll give you an example. Um, and I remember this years ago when Oprah was still on her daily show. And I, I think this was probably an Abraham thing that, kind of gotten into, woven into our societal um, cultural expectations, and it's what people started doing, even though people probably didn't know it came from Abraham. But when Abraham introduced the concept of if you focus on something for as little as 17 seconds, law of attraction will begin to bring you other like thoughts of a similar nature. Mm -hmm. And if you do it four times the 17, right. you actually start to manifest things in three-dimensional form. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good thing if you're wanting to manifest something that you deliberately desire. But what started to happen, and I remember this so distinctly when watching Oprah, you know, the guests would be on, on the stage and they'd be talking about something negative and in mid-sentence they'd recognize they just not said something that was negative and they would literally say out loud, cancel, cancel, cancel. <laughs> because it's like they cancel, wanted to like hold the words back before, heaven, you know, heaven forbid, law of attraction. <laughs> to get a hold of those negative words and off goes a cascading negative effect. Right. And I mean, th there's, there's, a, I don't know, I suppose there could be a little bit of truth to, um, you know, if you get on a negative jag for too long, it, you could definitely bring it into your world. Well, sure. Yeah. Um, but somebody just saying to you, well, you need to be positive. You need to be positive. And that's, that's going to help, um, you manifest what you want, just be positive. That is one that to me is a very surface level um, comment. And the reason I say that is because the underlying principle is the law of attraction doesn't know what your words are. The law of attraction is only able to gauge the vibrational quality of what you feel when you're speaking those words. Mm -hmm. And a lot, a lot of times people are not even aware because they haven't even thought about it yet to become aware that when they're saying something that, yes, they're using positive words, that oftentimes they're actually feeling the a negative uh, energetic vibration because they're really sad or upset or frustrated because they don't have this positive thing that they're saying. Yes. Are you, are you following me? Yeah, oh, definitely. In fact, I've experienced okay. it, so that's why I'm curious to know how you, where you're going to go with it. Well, and, and I just wanted to, like, highlight that point. So, like, okay, I'll just use me as an example. If I say, oh, no, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, but maybe outside of my awareness, I'm saying that with a whole lot of vehemence because I'm really afraid I'm going to get sick. Right. Or I know I have a big meeting, you know, in two days, and I have to be healthy for that. And so I may not be aware that I'm actually um, speaking the positive words with a lot of resistance underneath it. Yes. And so I have learned for myself that it takes, it's a little bit of an art, if you will, to start to identify it for yourself 
when you're not congruent, where your words are saying one thing, but your feelings are saying something else. Right, exactly. And so so that... I know, uh, like, for a long time, you know, my mother would send me an email about some difficulty going on in her life, and she'd she would say, well, I'm doing my best to speak positively, but here's all these bad things that are happening. <laughs> yeah, and you should just defeat it, right? <laughs> yeah, and so it was not an easy thing through email, but I did my best to try to convey it's not the words. It's can you, are you able to even identify or figure out what you're feeling when you're saying these things? And, you know, for a long time she goes, no, no, I feel good, I feel good. And I'm like, okay, um, if, if it was really all good, you'd be getting positive results. Right. That's what I know. Sure. And I also know if I, if I were talking to her on the phone and she would using, be using the positive words, I could actually sense energetically. I'm like, yeah, I don't think those words are really congruent. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it would take, takes quite a bit of effort to, you know, I don't want to say convince her of what I felt like I was saying was true, but to get to her to even have the awareness. Right, because that's the hard part, and that's what you're ultimately hoping is going to happen, that she decides yeah. to become aware of it and pay attention to it. Yes. And, so, the thing, the and thing, I mean, she's doing so much better with that now. Which is great. Um, that's fantastic. But, you fantastic. know, it took a lot of time, to, you know, and, and whether it's my mother or anybody else, it takes some time because it's, it's a skill that you have to develop mm-hmm. to really understand whether your words are congruent oh, yeah. with what you're yeah. Which means really you're tapping into as honestly as you can, what am I really feeling? And that's why I liked what when you talked about how you were kind of catching yourself on, on oh I'm feeling sick, oh I'm feeling this, oh I'm feeling that and then wait a minute, Wendy, you don't even believe that. I love that. But <laughs> but then you followed it up with what what is it that makes you feel happy? And that to me that that's my favorite response. What what makes you feel happy? Not what 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 do you think positively about, but what makes you feel happy? Because they're not necessarily the same thing. If it's very hard to say that I feel happy about something when I really don't feel happy about it. It's much easier for me to say I believe in something positive and not deep down not really believe in it. Not that it is impossible. It's just so much harder to do. So it's a much safer bet from my perspective to say, what makes you feel happy? And I I can almost always tell that I was right about that because it takes a long time for the response to come back because they're processing it, right? They're they're, they're trying to to think, well, what does make me happy? And and it can take a while. It can take a long time. I mean, if you're far enough away, it it, it may even be almost too much of a question to ask if you're really far away from it. Maybe you have to ask, you know, like, what makes you feel better just so you can get to the range where you can get to feel happy. Exactly. And that was the exact point I was going to make. Yeah. For some people, using the word happy may just not even be a word that they know how to process. Yeah, it can be too much sometimes. kind of like play around with other words. Now, now I will tell you, for me, um, happy was something I grew into. Happy was not a word that I used very much in mm. the past, um, but probably my go-to is the word good. Okay. Because I know if I feel good versus not good. You know. So yeah, sure. I mean, I, like I think of it as I prefer versus not not preferring, but it's just, it's essentially the same thing. If it's good, I like it. It is. It is. It's just that the word good would stimulate probably a faster response if you were to ask me a question versus happy. Oh, okay. And I'm not saying between you and me I'm debating it. I'm just making the no, point no. in general. Yeah. For other people who are listening who go- may think, well, good is not a word to relate to. Um, I don't know if I relate to happy. But like you said, better might be a word. Better is not bad, yeah. Yeah, you better know? better has a lot more potential because that's going to cover a lot more of the emotional range. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's kind of like whatever word it's works for you, you know, go with that. Right. Uh, and obviously for you, the word happy does work because I hear you use it quite often. It's, that, that's it, a positive thing for you. It works, and it's also, it was the route that I took to get out of depression. When I was in the mm-hmm. depressed state and, and it seemed like every single thought that came through my head was negative, and I don't really think I was exaggerating when I'm saying that. It really was. Every thought coming through my head was negative. I couldn't find any positive thoughts. My goal at that point was to get happy. Because I knew if I could get myself into a happy place and start feeling happy regularly, then all these negative uh, momentums would turn around and dissipate and get replaced with positive momentums. And what I wanted would start manifesting and my life would feel better and I'd be enjoying life better and all that other good stuff. So, yeah, happy became my mantra. And 
it was really what drove me to keep keep going, trying to find what what made me happy. I, I didn't even know at first. I couldn't even have told you when I was in that place what made me happy. If, if, I, I remember there were times when Louise and I would be talking, and Louise would be asking me, you know, so what would you like to do? What what would you love? And I would sit there blank. I had no answer. That's how bad it can get. So to me, finding happy, that was like nirvana. If I could find happy, oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, and, you know, just to kind of um, make sense of perhaps why it was hard to find happy was because, you know, when you talked about being depressed for so long and, and having so many negative thoughts, you know, law of attraction was providing all sorts of negativity for you. Very because, well, I might add. Because that's what you were focused on. <laughs> You know, there was a lot of momentum yeah, on there feeling certainly was. not happy. Oh, boy, and there was a so, ton of it. Yeah, so when you started asking, you know, or your wife was asking, well, what would make you happy? I totally get why that was so difficult to find a happy thought yeah. because you were so in a non-happy space. Very, very so, yeah. Very, very much you know. so. And, and that's where better actually does work. Um, what can you do that, to feel better? And I didn't really use better at that point in time. I was, I can't remember exactly what I used to be perfectly honest, but what I did try to use was kind of equivalent to better. What, what would, what would be nicer? What would be more pleasant? I think those were some of the words that I was using. And, uh, I, I remember I've told this story many times. The thing that kind of got me going was my wife suggesting, well, you'd like to go take walks. Go out and while you're on your walk, just you know, appreciate nature up close. Look at the details and, and, and just notice all the details, which was better than focusing all on all the negatives out there. It wasn't joyous. It wasn't, oh, boy, I can't wait to look at the details of the plants. <laughs> it wasn't that at all, but it was better, you know. But would you say that – Starting to walk and then starting to do it on a more regular basis is kind of what anchored you out of depression. Well, I was already walking actually. I had oh, okay. I've been walking for I've been taking walks since pretty much since we've been married and even before that. So we're talking twenty to twenty five years now. Wow. And and, I, and the depression was about ten to twelve years ago. So were you not walking during the time you were feeling depressed? There were periods of times when that was happening just for a number of reasons that were kind of outside my control at the time. Um, so I wasn't walking as often, and I was missing mm -hmm. that. But that was just fueling the downward depression. <laughs> it wasn't helping anything. Got it. <laughs> Got it. So walking was something that you did enjoy, at least on some level. And yeah. so that helped while you were in a state of feeling depression. When you started walking, it helped you to start to feel a little bit better because you are anchored to feeling better or right. feeling good when you walk. Yes, exactly, exactly. Like, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It does. Well, so. you know, since the topic is conflicting advice, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that for me as a life coach, um, I really, I, and I mean I struggled with this for a number of years, where I have, quote, my process of how I help people move from where they are to where they want to go. And before I ever learned Law of Attraction, I knew NLP and some other modalities. Uh -huh. And so those kind of were the first things I learned, and that's how I learned to really help people transform. Well, then, of course, once I learned Law of Attraction, I added a lot of that because I found that to actually be easier um, to help people understand how they can take what they're getting from me and, and go forward with it for the rest of their lives. So it's not just we're going to help you in this one area, but I, I feel like I'm giving them tools that will serve them well forever. Um, but one of the ways that I, one of the tools that I use is oftentimes I'll ask somebody, like if I start to hear certain things and what they're talking about, I might get an intuitive sense that there was something in childhood that actually um, prompted this this belief or this thing that was not serving them. And so I might ask them some childhood questions. Now, I will tell you, I don't dwell there. And I tell this to people up front, I may ask you a few questions because there could be some prime information that could help us get this cleared out. But I promise you, we're not going to go there. I'm not going to ask you to, like, relive the whole thing and cry all over again. Well, over and over, I would hear Abraham say, you don't have to trace a problem back to its origin. You can start where you are, and you can clean it up from there. 
Well, why that was conflicting for me was because I felt like since they kept telling people over and over, you don't have to go backwards, you don't have to find the place of origin, I felt like, and this could have just, this was probably just how I took it, um, because I wanted to be a really good, you know, law of attraction teacher. Oh, sure. Um, I felt like, oh, there must be something wrong with my process. I must be missing something. I must be, you know... Like, I, like I'm resistant to giving up the process that I know has worked for me for years with both myself and others. And so to me, that felt like conflicting information. Because every time I heard Abraham say, you don't have to go backwards, you can use whatever circumstances is causing you distress today to clean up that vibration, I thought I was doing something wrong. And we- so to me, that felt conflicting. Um But when I was on the Cancun land cruise, I had internalized the question that I wanted to get resolution on this thing that I considered a conflict of interest. Because if there was a better way to do something where people didn't have to talk about anything from their past, I wanted that to be available to me. But if it was, I didn't know how to do it. Oh, sure, yeah. One day... um, the land cruise was five days, or, or five days of Abraham workshops. And I remember on the third day going in, and as Esther comes out on the stage and people are applauding for her, I just heard inside of me all of your answers will be, all the questions that you've just asked will be answered today. And I was like, woohoo, that's exciting. Really? And all of a sudden, yeah. So Esther, you know, goes into her Abraham thing. She starts speaking as Abraham. And one of the sentences she said was, you know, and it might not have been in the preamble, but it was like sometime throughout that morning, um, the issue came up about negative things and pr- somebody needing to clean up their vibration. And I heard Abraham say, do whatever it takes to clean up this vibration. It doesn't matter what you do, and this might be the a little bit more of the difficult work, but do whatever it takes to clean this up. Uh-huh. And somehow those words, do whatever it takes, penetrated my understanding and all of a sudden what what there was like a a clarity for me that allowed me to recognize there was nothing wrong with the processes that i had been using Mm -hmm. i just assessed i assumed the meaning of abraham saying you don't have to go back into your past to clear up this vibration i assumed the meaning that they were saying don't go back into your past ah not the same thing, though. They didn't say don't. They just said, now I heard it, do whatever it takes. And you don't have to go back into the past. And I went, oh, son of a gun. Huh. And, I mean, that changed it for me. And I realized I don't go back into the past hardly at all anyway. But when I feel like that's the direction I'm being guided to go, I no longer have this struggle thing inside of me like, oh, my God, I'm doing something where it's not the easy way, and I'm making myself miserable over it. (laughs) Well, what you're talking about is something that Louise brought up a number of times, because Louise, as I think I've told you in our audience, uh, for about 10 years was a psychotherapist and was trained Mm -hmm. in psychotherapy and was actually very good at it. She had a very good track record. Um, But one of of the things that kind of made the law of attraction theory as presented by Abraham difficult to her was this issue that you're bringing up because she really firmly believed if you don't root out something that's like a deep down thing, you can try to attract all you want. You'll never get into the right vibration to achieve what you're trying to attract. So again, the, the same dichotomy, how, how deep do you go? Do you, should you, should you root out something that's, that's you know really bad from your past in order to get past it and so forth? And I, th- I think you answered it very eloquently. I think Abraham answered it very eloquently. Do what you ever do, whatever you have to do. Um, I mean, there is an instance yeah. of that. We're talking about the, uh, the the groups on on Facebook. There was a person who posted something just a few hours ago, and I'll, I'll paraphrase it because, quite honestly, what they they wrote was pretty disjointed. It's very clear this person is not in a good place at all. And plus, um, English isn't their first language anyway, so that just compounds it a bit. But this person, among other things, was talking about uh, feeling unworthy, feeling suicidal, experiencing suicidal thoughts, um, having bursts of depression and anger that uh, she expressed to her parents and then later apologizing for it. And the parents didn't really know what to do and 
how when uh, she has these dreams, uh, other things aren't uh, uh, regarding her family are happening. She doesn't understand why. Negative thoughts are coming to her mind all the time. I mean, this is clearly a person who's got something really, really, really difficult going on, some sort of really deep pain going on. And it, it's somebody. I my my advice to her was when you're starting to th- to think suicidal thoughts, don't go to a, a, an LOA group. You, the first thing you need to do is find a good therapist and just root that out. Because until you root that out, you're just going to get haunted by it. You got to get past that. Then once you found out what that is, and the therapist is helping you figure out what your path out is, that's the time to apply LOA principles. Because now you've got your way out. But first, you got to get the get at the thing, find out what it is. That was my point to her. Um, but I also saw people who were who were commenting to her well you just have to get yourself into a good frame of mind and you have to do this and that you know all the LOA stuff and I'm thinking this is a person who's having suicidal thoughts that, that's a very serious situation you can't just throw basic LOA theory at that you, ha- you have to address the suicidal thoughts it's, it's primary well no I mean there are there is an understanding of how law of attraction could actually benefit her oh of course um, but but going from one extreme of suicide, which is about the lowest um, vibrational broadcast you can have, to just think positive thoughts, which is so far away oh. from where she is, it's like she can't even hear that, let alone process it. Exactly. You know, exactly. and so even you know, if somebody were to just say something to comfort her, this would be the place with the me too. Like I have felt that way before, mm-hmm. you know, and I know it really sucks being where you are. Um, you know, hopefully things can get better, but I get it that right now it doesn't feel very good. Yeah. And having somebody just witness them and, you know, in that way, sometimes a person can, like a person who's feeling suicidal, can grab just a little bit of that because it's not so far away from where they are at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, you know, most of the time we, I think most law of attraction people or anybody who's in the positive psychology movement would want to say, well, you know, you want to offer positive advice. But if somebody's in a really negative place, they can't receive. You cannot receive something that's so far away from where you currently are. Yeah. And yeah. that's why, like, you know, you, you probably watch shows like I have at movies, you know, where somebody's suicidal and they call a suicide prevention hotline. Mm-hmm. And the typical thing, which I, I am in agreement with, is where instead of saying, oh, my God, you know, whatever you do, don't kill yourself, <laughs> they'll, they'll want to know what's going on, why are you feeling this way, which, you know, again, traditional LOA would say, oh, you don't want to talk more negativity. But if, they, if they're talking, it, that's movement. Yes. It may be movement with their mouth, with their head. At least they're in movement because the thoughts of suicide can be the most stuck thoughts you can have. And actually somebody who is truly suicidal and on the brink of it, the the most telling signal is that they shut up. Correct. They shut up. They don't talk to anybody. So to me, if somebody even reaches out to a suicide hotline, that's their way of saying, I really don't want to do this thing that I say I'm wanting to do, and this is my way of showing it, or I wouldn't have called. Mm, yeah. yeah. So in a way, they're saying, I'm open to what you have to say to me. It, it's just that, you know, the, the people in suicide hotlines are being trained. Don't just throw happy, happy smiley faces right. at them verbally. <laughs> yeah, because they're not in the place to receive it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would say um, when I've – read other people's things where they're giving advice, probably the most inappropriate thing I have ever read has been where somebody's in one state of mind and somebody throws platitudes at them. Mm. That's like so far off from where they are emotionally that they can't receive it or they get pissed off at it. You know, and sometimes it even becomes a see, I knew nobody would understand because look at all these stupid things that people are saying to me. Yeah, it's one of those things that can actually work the opposite of what the person thinks is going to happen by giving out the advice that they gave in the first place. It produces the opposite result, which is exactly. it's that that can actually be kind of shocking and surprising when you think about it. And and there are a lot of different ways that can happen. There, it, it can happen in situations where it seems perfectly reasonable and normal to conclude that if you say A, it's going to lead to B, and then it doesn't. 
Joel and I were talking about that this morning. We're, at one point, he he reiterated a story that he's told before about how you know he was a um, a gambling addict. He was a raging gambling addict. He had stolen money to support his, his habit, and he was uh, going to get arrested and and was appearing for the ju- before the judge and so forth. And when he appeared before the judge, he said to the judge. I'm guilty, and and his defender was a public defender was saying, "Shut up! Don't say anything." He says, "No, no, no! I, I'm guilty. I'm ready to face whatever the consequences are. I want all this to be done. I want it to be over with." And when they they put him in the jail cell and locked the door, his response was, "Thank God! Finally, this has come to an end." Because his biggest fear was he was going to get thrown in jail. Now it was there, so the biggest fear was no longer a fear. It was a reality, but it was no longer a fear. And so his perception of that whole experience was completely different from what my perception of it might have been if I was watching him go through it saying, oh, poor Joel. I mean, he's, he's been thrown in prison. And Joel's reaction was, thank goodness. <laughs> yes. Now, I've never been imprisoned. However, I do understand the concept behind Joel's idea because I've had things where I had a huge fear. And when the very thing that I feared the most had come upon me, I was able to go, okay, this isn't as bad as I thought. I'm still here. I'm still alive. The consequences, uh, wait a minute, there aren't even any consequences. Mm. Then I'm like, who the heck taught me that this is a fear? And I'd figure it out, and I'd just kind of laugh at it, thinking this is not even something I needed to fear. And the very fact that I feared it for so long actually continued the resistance on this thing that didn't let me get free of the very object that I feared. So once I did it, once I did the thing I feared, the fear to me, it immediately dissipated. Yeah, that's that's an interesting uh, phenomenon that happens. And I actually learned that one very early, long before I learned Law of Attraction. Um, ever since I can remember, dating back to like, my teenage years, for whatever reason, people, friends, acquaintances, people who barely knew me felt like they could just confide in me about stuff which shocked the hell out of me because I had no idea why they were doing it. <laughs> I didn't have a clue. I, I'll, I'll even tell you, there was a situation when I was in school. I, my first year of school, I went to the State University of New York at Buffalo, and they had a new campus, relatively new. Um, it's still called the new campus uh, in Amherst. And at that campus, there were these kind of avant-garde style uh, architecture buildings um, that were the dorms. They were primarily dor- dormitories. There were also a few classrooms, but it was mostly just uh, dormitory living. And each of them had this one tower. I, there's no other way to describe it. It was like a castle tower. Um, most of the, the buildings were like three or four stories, but the tower would go up 10 stories, and there were rooms just off of that, that tower up there. So it was a very strange-looking architecture. Uh, and I remember one time just deciding to ride up the elevator to the 10th floor just to kind of have a look around of one of those towers, right? And I'm up there, and I see this person who's who's really not looking very well at all. Come to find out, this person was commi- was was considering jumping off the building. And I'm thinking, Ooh. oh my god, what if I walked into? <laughs> you know, I didn't know what to do, and so I, I just kind of stood there, and I, I, he he was talking to me, and so I I just started talking to him. And he starts spilling out his problems and so forth. And, and I'm riveted, like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? So I just kept listening because I didn't know what else to do, right? Bottom line, long story short, and it is a very long story, but eventually I talked him down. And I never saw him again, so I never really knew what happened. But from that point on, I kept experiencing people just confiding stuff in me. And, and it really, really confused me. But what I did learn very early on is... Because of my own curiosity, I would ask them, so what do you think is going to happen? And they'd say, well, you know, ABC and ABC, you know, certainly seem to be pointing in a negative direction and not really sure what they thought about. I'd say, well, so what happens after ABC? And they'd say, well, DEF. And then I'd say, well, what happens after DEF? And and they'd say, well, it's DEF. I mean, come on. (laughs) I said, yeah, but what happens after (laughs) DEF? And they'd say, I don't know. And then I could see it dissipating just the way you were describing. And I said, whoa, that worked. What did I just do? <laughs> I didn't know what I had done. <laughs> it took me a while to realize what the pattern was, that if I just asked them to look at what the worst possible scenario was, they would find it, the worst possible scenario wasn't all that bad after all. And, and so I, I used that for the longest time whenever I had people who would approach me out of the blue and say, you know, uh, start talking to me and spilling out their guts and 
I never did find out why they do that. <laughs> but, and that was my that was my go to when I needed to talk to somebody. It was like, so what's so what's the next worst thing that happens, right? <laughs> and you know, to me, honestly, that's that's one of the tools that I use when I'm working with people. Is it really? If they really have a huge fear of something. I'll say, well, tell me what's the worst thing that you can imagine would happen in this situation. And sometimes I could almost hear them like holding their breath, like. Really? You're wanting me to tell you that? Yeah, right. <laughs> that you're supposed to be like taking me in the opposite direction? <laughs> but if I could get them to say out loud what the worst case scenario is, and we just talk about it, and then we reframe some parts of it, we find out it's not so horrible. The fear was worse than what they thought would really happen, because the fear kind of blocks the, well, what would really happen if. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah. I could see why that would work, but that's very cool that um, you created a little sphere of influence that you know people talked to you and ended up feeling better after doing so. Now, at the same time, I have to say, I wonder what my own thought process was that I kept drawing these people to me because I've not figured that one out, and I probably don't want to know actually because that would mean recreating the thought process. But there must have been something going on that, that was attracting them because I, I got it a lot. I had a lot of people come to me like that. So hmm. now I, I haven't used that. Going, I wonder what was going on inside of you that maybe you didn't want to look at for your own stuff, but you were projecting it outside of you so that other people would do it. I, I'm not really sure. And uh, I mean, I do remember it, it's been a while since I've used that technique. But the last time I used it was on myself, really. My wife was trying to help me. And she used the same technique on me and encouraged me to do it because she knew I, she knew I had done it in the past. So I, I started applying it, and that's when I realized that I was depressed about stuff. But when I looked at the stuff, it wasn't worth being depressed about, and I I wasn't <laughs> sure what to do about that. I didn't know I wasn't sure what to do with that. Like, okay, on the one hand, the stuff that I'm being depressed about in the grand scheme of things really doesn't amount to very much. On the other hand, I'm depressed about it. What the heck do I do with that? Because I was on the other side of the, the coin there, you know? I was the one who was, who need, needed to figure out, okay, so I've gotten there, now what do I do with it? And I didn't have an answer. Fortunately, my wife had some good ideas. So she, you know, being a psychotherapist, she, she gave me some guidance, but I didn't know what to do with it. I had no clue. I, I, I mean, once you get there, it, it does break the pattern, but in and of itself, it doesn't heal you. So I, I needed to figure out what the healing was, and that, that's ultimately what she helped me to do. Mm. Yeah. But you can certainly agree, I, I think we can both agree, that uh, that's the kind of thing that if somebody tries to help somebody else in a group and they don't really know what they're doing, I mean, I got kind of lucky with that one guy because I, I could have very easily given bad advice or done the wrong thing without realizing it. Um, maybe not. Maybe just because of who I am, because I am a listener. I mean, it's kind of, built into me so maybe that's what well, that was going to save me no matter what but it, it it does kind of remind me i want to be careful i don't want to be the person who's trying to give advice all the time because my advice may not always be good you know i don't want to assume that i have the answer for somebody else in fact i'm learning more and more just how rarely i understand where the other person is coming from even when it seems obvious I mean, like Joel going being thrown into prison 25 years ago. My my take on that was, oh, poor Joel. And that was not at all what his take was on it. And he was the one being thrown in. <laughs> I mean, I really misread that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I don't, this is probably has nothing to do with the whole Joel thing, but it's what I'm thinking on. Um, when you go to a Abraham Hicks event, here's what I have found almost every single time that people there are minding their P's and Q's, mm -hmm. meaning they don't want to say anything to a stranger that gives any impression that they don't know what they're talking about <laughs> or they're not a good Abraham Hicks student. Um, and I just think it's funny because I, I've been to several events and, you know, I'll get into conversation with people, and I can tell, in a sense, they're guarded because they'll start to talk and then as soon as they say something, they'll go, oh, but, 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 I've, but I've learned beyond that. I'm just talking about something in the past. Because it's like they're so afraid that, you know, they'll be judged as a really bad LOA student, you know? Uh, I, I actually feel but sorry for them that, that, that they're doing that. I, I feel bad for them, which I shouldn't do. But nevertheless, well, I, feel, I feel bad for them. I think, 
I think, this is just my take, I think that's somebody who's relatively new, but they've been doing it long enough that in their own minds they've judged that they should know better. Oh, yeah. Well, well, we are certainly you know, our, our own worst critics. There's no doubt about that. And that may be what that's an, uh, an aspect of. But, you know, there was one event I went to, um, and I will tell you, I, I, for the most part I'm not that judgmental of people, and I don't think I judged him. I was just really, like, surprised. Um, because It was right after the election, and he was on the non-Trump side of the equation, which mm-hmm. he was on the Hillip side. Right. And... He was so upset. Mm. I'm so upset that Trump won. And I mean, like, you could just see the grief on him. Yeah. Where you, he couldn't crack a smile to, to, for anything. And Abraham was trying to conjole him. And, you know, he was just like, but, but, but. And, you know, he's like, and there's all these LOA groups, and we don't understand it. He was identifying with huge groups of people who he felt were all, you know, in agreement with his position. Mm. And I was thinking, what groups of people is he talking about? Because I don't know who he's talking about. (laughs) But, you know, that's his thing. And so Abraham went on and described, you know, the energetics behind the election. And what was really fascinating is it was a perfect opportunity for Abraham to say, all for all the people that had so much resistance against Trump, they were actually helping to elect Trump. Yes. Which, I mean, I've heard them say that every time there's an election, but this was kind of like a, this guy, bless his heart, he's on stage. Uh, you could tell he couldn't accept that. Mm. He's like, but I'm, I'm so pro-love, I'm so pro-love, and he's not. And I'm thinking, well, how do you know Trump's not about love? But, mm. okay, maybe you can say that based on things that he says. But it's still assumptions, because I still believe nobody really knows what's in the heart of any human being. That's right. Except for energy. Yeah. But nonetheless, he was making a bunch of assumptions, and he was. it was really hard to console him. And so, but it was one of the most fascinating discussions I've ever heard Abraham have. And so when, um, you know, we were taking a break, I ran into him, and I was just curious. I'm like, now what groups were you talking about? Mm. And so he was telling me, he goes, oh, they're Abraham Hicks Law of Attraction Facebook groups. And I'm like, oh, okay. And who knows, Walt? It may even be the one that you're connected with. It's possible. I don't know. Um, but here's what really floored me is he works for the Abraham Hicks organization. Really? Interesting. He attends every single workshop. Wow. And I purposely won't give away what role he does just right. because I keep his anonymity. Yeah, absolutely. But I've seen him before. And when I went to the one most recently, I ran into him and said hello. So it's like he's there. He works for that organization. He hears Abraham speaking, you know, at least at this point twice a month, um, if not more, because when Jerry was live, sometimes they did five workshops a month. Mm. But I thought, wow, you really – don't know what you know until you know it. Yeah, it's true. And this this was just an area that for him, the whole, everything that occurred defied his understanding. And he had some very strong points of view and didn't understand why, with everything he knew, that wasn't enough to change the course of the election. And he was, based on the things he was saying, and I don't say this in judgment, but these were just the factual things he was saying, it was very obvious that he was very resistant to Trump. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was so much resistance, and Abraham was doing their best to convey that. But you know what? He wasn't receiving it. Mm. It was very obvious he wasn't receiving it. Now, here's the part I, I marvel at. You're talking to God. Now, some people might have an issue with that, but they're source energy. They are, you know, non-physical consciousness. You are talking to infinite intelligence, and this man was not accepting what they had to say. Mm. Yeah. And, it, you know, it made me think to myself, oh, my gosh, how many times have I done that? Exactly. Like, That's if, my thought, too. If, if God could personify himself or herself and stand in front of me and say, Wendy, you're wrong, this is the way it needs to be, I still would go, no, don't think so. I think you're wrong. Because, <laughs> you know, when we have some really solid, 
solid beliefs in things, sometimes it takes an awful lot to shake us out of it. It does. It does. In fact, I, I had the same observation. I, I, was, I saw a lot of people who had the reaction that guy had. They weren't all working for Abraham Hicks, but they had the same reaction, just absolutely stunned disbelief about the election. And we actually, it, both my wife and I have talked with some who were in that camp. And my wife came up with something right on election day that has stuck with me ever since. I, I thought she just nailed the whole situation really, really well. Because we all know what kind of a publicity hound Trump is. I mean, he stirs up controversy for a living. That's that's where he gets his energy from. And it proves to me he really doesn't have full understanding of LOA. He has partial understanding, and that helped him uh, uh, you know, acquire his fortune. But he also does. He, he's missing some some big pieces. It's very evident to me. But anyway, she pointed out he's he he pretty much exemplifies somebody who has borderline personality disorder. You know, he he is constantly keeping himself in the spotlight. Uh, it, it's also a little bit confusing because it, it's it does sound very similar to somebody who's narcissistic. Um, but either way that you want to look at, it, this is a guy who just he he lives for negative publicity. He isn't happy until he has all kinds of negative attention on him. The negative attention doesn't work against him. It works for him. He loves it. He eats it up. So my wife said, what would happen, do you think, if now that he's won the election, if all the news media and all of his opposition stopped paying attention to him? Just stopped. (laughs) I mean, think about that. It would be pretty much the end of the Trump phenomenon. And yet that was the one thing that these people who got so frustrated couldn't do. They couldn't just stop paying attention to them, could they? You know, people, well, and you know because you had been so emotionally invested in politics for so long um, that people who are invested in politics have a, a huge stake in a certain point of view. Right. And it's very hard to shake. It is. Yeah. Um, and just in, I know we just have a few minutes, but um, I, I remember telling you about how when I had worked at broadcast radio station, one of the stations was talk radio and they did political conversation. And when I left the station and was no longer listening to it, I said my happiness quotient rised um, incredibly. And I didn't realize how much the talk radio for two years had really brought me down. Mm. And little by little their perspectives became my perspective. Oh, yeah. Well, what's interesting is I'm Facebook friends with both of the person and the political personalities that were at that station, and one of them recently, um, without any warning, the station owner changed their mind, and boom, he was no longer employed, and he didn't even get a chance to say goodbye to his fans, mm. so he did via Facebook. Right. So he had been in Kansas City, um, because when he left here, I didn't know where he went. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, I just responded to one of the comments that somebody had made, and it was a chance for us to kind of like connect for a moment. Sure. And it was nice to know he still remembered me. Yeah. Well, I got a, um, a private message on Facebook uh, yesterday from him, like in the morning, and uh-huh. I'm like, whoa, I wouldn't have expected that. And he said, hey, the old station called me back to like be a guest host for a couple days. And he goes, so I'll be on the air tomorrow from 4 to 7. If, you, if you'll listen, maybe tell your friends. And he goes, here's the email of the program manager. And if you, you know, I'm kind of hoping people will write to him to bring me back. So I thought, well, even though I don't listen to political stuff anymore, I like him. So I want to listen because I was kind of curious. So when mm-hmm. our show was over, I tuned into him. And I'll tell you what, his show's three hours long. I only listened to about an hour of it. And I came to the point, I started getting a headache. I mean, splitting headache. Wow. And I don't think this had to do with the cold symptoms because that was not part of my symptomology. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that energy is so not who I am anymore that it literally was causing this incredible discomfort. And so I turned it off, and within about an hour, the headache totally subsided. And I went, you know what? That just doesn't take me into any positive vibrations. Even though I like how this guy talks about things, I could kind of sense on a bigger energetic level of how it was tapping into so many people's opinions that were of such a negative quality that I'm like, ooh, energetically, I need to jump out of this. Mm. Which shows just how far your own development has come since you you worked at that that radio station. But yeah, 
That, so it, that was just an interesting experience it is. yesterday. Now, of course, as I'm looking at the clock, I found we have like 15 seconds left, so we have to cut it really short, unfortunately. And I hate to end on a, on a sad note because that's kind of a sad note, but uh, uh, all I can say is no, tomorrow's going to be happy, better. It was a happy note for me because I realized how sensitive I've become. Well, that's to true. Energy, so I, I know how to go to where it's good for me. <laughs> that's true. Well, that's true, yeah. And, and you basically stopped doing what didn't feel good and started doing what felt good, which is the right thing to do. So you're right. That is the happy note. You're right. So I, I will draw the line there. And uh, just say that uh, I, I, I found this to be a, an intriguing topic. We probably could have gone on for a couple hours, but we don't have that. So all I can say is let's just do it again tomorrow. You got it. All right. And we'll see you all tomorrow here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye now. <laughs>